Good afternoon, everybody. This is Bassam Haddad, and we are here joined with the two fabulous scholars, Nur Juda and Jihad Abu Salim, for the Gaza in Context Collaborative uh, Teaching Series. Um, this particular teaching is on Gaza and geography. This is a collective of more than 22 university institutions and research centers coming together to address what is going on today in Gaza and Gaza. And we are uh, delighted to have our speakers with us. Uh, this is our fourth teaching. We had the Gaza 101 introduction uh, teaching, followed by Gaza and history, and then followed by Gaza and the question of human rights and the war in Palestine. Today, we uh, will be addressing a, a different sort of topic, and I'm very delighted to have with us uh, Noor Juda and uh, Jihad Abu Salim. Noor and Juda, how are you? Very, very good, Bassam. Thank you for having us. Hanging in there as we all are right now. Thank you so much for having us, Bassam. Um, I'm very delighted you are with us. A lot of uh, the work that we've been doing here has been actually shared um, across uh, you know, various continents and various uh, institutions and actually has been uh, shown in classrooms and beyond. So uh, I hope people are able to make use of this. I am uh, excited to address this topic, which actually spans a lot more than geography. A lot of people ask me, what does, how does geography work in this case? So I'm glad you are here. I'll let you now take the floor. And I know that you have a PowerPoint to share. Yes, let me get that started. As you are doing this, uh, let me say a couple of words about our speakers who uh, are actually magnificent in their own right and uh, have done quite a bit of work at various levels. Uh, Noor Judah is an assistant professor in the Department of Asian American Studies at UCLA. She holds a PhD in geography and her dissertation, Mapping Decolonized Futures, um, Indigenous Visions for Hawaii and Palestine, highlights the efforts by Palestinian and native Hawaiian communities to use indigenous counter mapping as a, a cartographic and decolonial praxis to imagine and work toward toward liberated futures. Jihad Abu Salim is executive director of the Jerusalem Fund and Palestine Center uh, in Washington, DC. He is completing his PhD in the history, in the history and uh, Hebrew, in the history and Hebrew and Juda the Judaic studies joint program at U New York University. His main area of research is Palestinian and Arab perceptions of the Zionist project and the Jewish question before 1948. Jihad recently edited the book, Light in Gaza, Writings Born of Fire, published by Haymarket Books in 2022. Welcome again, uh, Noor and Jihad, and we are ready for your presentation. Okay, can you see the, the uh, PowerPoint yes. okay? Okay, great, great. Um, okay, well, thank you, uh, Bassam, and to all of the partners of the Gaza in Context series, and thank you to everyone tuning in. I know many of us are spread incredibly thin these days, be it with work or emotionally or both, um, and we're very happy you could join us away from kind of the monstrosity of news and data on death to zoom out with us for a little bit. If you're watching a uh, recorded version of this later, we hope that it can be a resource for you in your classrooms and communities. Jihad and I are going to do our best today to run through this teaching material together as opposed to doing completely separate presentations. Um, something that we have talked about together a lot over the years as colleagues and friends as, and as individuals with family um, in, in, the, in, uh, in the Gaza Strip, um, is the gap in familiarity between Gaza and the West Bank. Um, much of this, of course, has to do with the separation of the two since the start of the siege and a catastrophic loss of access to movement for individuals and organizations to the Gaza Strip. However, some of this goes beyond that and speaks to a lot of different factors, um, not the least of which is the population density uh, of Gaza and the synonymization of the term Gaza for, for the city and uh, once district and now Gaza Strip. So often gliding over a lot of how many of the towns and refugee camps make up the area. The title uh, for today, Fence to Fence, comes from a chapter that Jihad wrote in the collection Gaza as Metaphor. And we're using it as part of the inspiration to start our conversation today. 
Palestinians in Gaza often refer to the Strip, saying, we are trapped min al silik la silik, from fence to fence. This simple phrase sums up Gaza's current reality, a fenced place surrounded by dead ends and within it, a caged human sea. Personally, uh, as a geographer, I have been taught right, to understand space as a process, as a culmination of history, of lived experience, culture, and possibility. And I was taught space is always alive and dynamic, never static, never dead. Increasingly, I think, as we stare at the spaces of Gaza on our screens, so much of which has been reduced to rubble in the last weeks, it becomes harder to find that life and that process of space. We are watching neighborhoods and towns and Gaza City itself evacuated and emptied only to fill other areas to the brim. Meanwhile, all of these areas are unsafe and subject to destruction. So today we're gonna to try and do three main things. First is to talk a bit about Gaza as a district before 1948 um, and the Nakba. And then also how that rupture fills what we know today as the Gaza Strip with hundreds of thousands of the district's residents um, and residents of other districts, which is something I think we also tend to look over. Second is to give a breakdown of places in the Gaza Strip, helping to familiarize uh, you, the audience, with key places and their significance. And then finally, we want to talk about how that geography comes into play with the gen genocidal war machine that we have seen unleashed on Gaza in the last 26 days. I also really wanna encourage folks to go back and watch our Gaza and History episode from the series with Shirin, uh, Saikari, Shara Dumani, and Elana Feldman. There's a lot that Jihad and I are going to uh, unfortunately gloss over more than we would like. So for a more detailed discussion on resistance and life in the Gaza Strip um, over the last eight decades and the last 16 years of siege. Um, please go back and take a look at that episode. There's a lot of uh, rich history. We, we won't have as much time to get into um, for this particular episode. So Jihad is going to start us off um, with some pre nakba history on the, on, the, on the district. Thank you, Noor. And again, thank you so much, Bassam, for uh, hosting us today. Um, when it comes to understanding Gaza and the reality it's facing today uh, and the, the trajectory of Gaza's history as part of the broader context of uh, Palestinian history and, and regional history, it is important to go back to uh, the pre-1948 era um, and especially to the first half of the 20th century. Um, before there was a Gaza Strip, there was the region uh, known as the Gaza District. Uh, as of 1945, within British Mandate Palestine, there existed six main districts without internal borders. Uh, there were these were borderless administrative uh, districts um, uh, in, in, in historic Palestine in Mandatory Palestine, um, and each of each one of these districts comprised smaller subdistricts. The Gaza district was the largest. Uh, in historic Palestine, incorporating both the Gaza and Be'er Seba sub-districts, um, and they in, uh, and and these and the Gaza district included major cities um, that were at the core of of these sub-districts and uh, that functioned as central hubs for administration, politics, economics, and culture. At the core of the Gaza sub-district stood the ancient city of Gaza, with its long-standing history. Um, characterized by its minarets, churches, mosques, markets, alleys, and gates, um, representing the pulse of the area and its continuity for uh, generations. Uh, there, a lot can be said about Gaza's district pre-48 history. And uh, throughout this presentation, I will try to capture some of the aspects of this history uh, and talk about its importance and why this history is still relevant today. So as you can see in the map, um, the both sub-districts to the south, Be'er Seba and Gaza, were part of a single administrative unit called the Gaza District. And uh, the map to the right shows the, the map of the railroad in, in, in mandatory Palestine, um, which underscores the you know, Gaza's infrastructural importance before 48 as the hub that 
uh, you know, that was home to a major train station that connected Gaza with the rest of historic Palestine, but also with the region. In the 1920s, um, an Egyptian journalist published a book uh, detailing his trip to uh, Palestine, Lebanon, and Syria. And uh, th this, this train ride that he went on was the, the main lens through which he talked about how he visited Palestine, Lebanon, and Syria. So there was this contiguity and this connection. Um, and of course, when it comes to looking at Gaza on, on this map, whether the city or the district, um, it is important to also view it as a crucial juncture that connected uh, not only parts of Palestine or the Arab world, but also two continents. Um, if you're leaving Asia towards Africa, the last urban center that you stop uh, in is Gaza City and vice versa. So Gaza City and the surrounding towns and villages served as, uh, as a gateway for trade and travel. And I will talk about this in detail later. And then, uh, and of course, you know, um, like the rest of Palestine and, and the region, Gaza uh, was incorporated into the global economic market in the late 19th century. And I highly recommend reading uh, Dutan Halevi's uh, article, Gaza's Happy Hour, which talks about Gaza's role in global agricultural trade in the late 19th century and how barley that was uh, planted and harvested in the vicinity of Gaza uh, was uh, uh, one of the key products of the Victorian era that used in, in the production uh, of, uh, uh, of different kinds of products. And, uh, and of course, you know, I will also talk later on about the cultural and spiritual uh, uh, importance um, of Gaza as, as a central hub for uh, the, the Gaza region and, and, uh, uh, and, and what that meant for Palestinians there. So, again, before 1948, the, the Gaza district was a qada, or a district, an administrative region of Mandate Palestine as it was during the four centuries of Ottoman rule. And by the end of the British mandate, the 1948 Gaza sub-district, uh, the area of that sub-district was around 1,196 square kilometers, which included three major cities, Gaza, al Majdal, now Ashkelon, and Khan Yunus, and many other towns, cities, and villages um, that, uh, that are around 53 in, in, ter in terms of their number. and. And, and it is important to acknowledge uh, this, this fact here, that throughout history, the area of the Gaza district uh, perhaps changed in size, but for centuries it had maintained most of the area that was officially part of the Gaza sub-district uh, on the eve of the 1948 Nakba. Uh, so the long historical consistency of Gaza's position as a political, economic, and cultural center for the surrounding area placed it uh, at the heart of this district. These dynamics, relations, and interactions within the, the, the Gaza space were the result of centuries of consistent connection between the city and its surroundings that were barely disrupted except in short periods of political turmoil. And this brings us to 1948, which uh, you know, we will talk about, um, a moment that radically disrupted this state of affairs, affecting dr um, uh, driving dramatic changes on all levels political, demographic, economic, and social. And I will use this, um, this uh, mausim, this uh, festival, as one example of what uh, this connectivity and contiguity represented for the residents of the, uh, of, the region, of the Gaza region, the Gaza district. So as you all know, uh, before 1948, Palestine was famous for uh, local and regional uh, festivals or mawasim. Uh, they had religious and spiritual significance for the residents of Palestine. Um, and uh, so, for example, we had Mawsim and Nabi Musa, uh, Mawsim and Nabi Rubin. But in the Gaza region, uh, there was Mawsim Wadi Naml. Um, which was a uh, spiritual and cultural festival that people celebrated in Gaza annually. And people made pilgrimage to this uh, mausim from different parts of the Gaza region, from more than 54 cities, towns, and villages. And uh, they, they gathered at a point between, uh, halfway between Asqalan and Gaza. Um, and they gathered, they, they you know, uh, 
engaged in so, all sorts of spiritual, cultural, and festive activities. Um, but comes 1948, this festival, which was an important part of the social and cultural life of Palestinians in Gaza then, was disrupted like many other aspects of life in Gaza, which I will highlight also uh, uh, later on. So moving to the Nakba, and I think this is an important uh, uh, element in understanding Gaza. Uh, Gaza cannot be understood without, without recognizing the, the, the rupture that was caused by the Nakba. Understanding the historical context in which the Gaza Strip, with its many problems and crises, emerged is the key to making sense of Gaza's present reality and of Gaza's past, present, and future. The central element of this historical context is the Nakba, the catastrophe of 1948, um, as this was a moment of spatial and territorial rupture experienced by most of the uh, Palestinians in, in, in the Gaza area, in, in, in the area in Gaza's vicinity, but and also in most of historic Palestine. In this sense, the Nakba is not history relegated to the past, but history lived in the present. The Nakba is still present in Gaza, not only by the continuation of the state of refugeehood, but also by the continuity of the rupture that it caused. Um, the Nakba had a catastrophic outcome for Palestinians in general, in addition to disrupting Palestinian social formation and identity development, it prevented Palestinians from enjoying territorial independence and sovereignty over the land where they embraced their heritage and culture and witnessed their earlier national development. Palestinian nationalism crystallized with a clear agenda to establish independence over all of historic Palestine. And of course, uh, this was part of a vision uh, that, was, that was rooted in existing cultural, social, economic, and political uh, practices and connections within the space of historic Palestine in general, and within each of the bigger regions inside Palestine itself. In this sense, the Gaza Strip was born of the Nakba, of the 1948 Nakba, and then and, and, and so the term strip qitar in Arabic was a geographic unit uh, that emerged out of this reality. Um, so, you know, just to, to wrap up this, this segment, um, it, it is important to think about the Nakba as a central element in the creation of what is today the Gaza Strip and to think about uh, the 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 board and to think about the borders of the current gaza strip as an a monument of the nakba which uh, led to the expulsion of 200,000 palestinian refugees from uh, nearby areas who ended up in eight refugee camps in the gaza strip and of course uh, in addition to other hundreds of thousands of palestinians who ended up as refugees in other parts of palestine or in neighboring arab countries and um, and, and and of course um, in 1948, when the Gaza Strip emerges as a product of uh, of the Nakba, uh, for Palestinians who ended up on the on the Gaza side of the armistice line, this process wasn't supposed to be eternal. Uh, the the fact the fact that they ended up as refugees for many of these Palestinians was something that they believed to be temporary. That after the war uh, ends, that they would be able to go home. This, was, this wasn't an unprecedented situation in, in 1917 when British forces occupied Gaza and flattened it. Gaza's 22,000 uh, Palestinian residents ended up as refugees in near, nearby areas, but after the end of World War I, everybody went home. That didn't happen in 1948, and, um, and, and, and we can talk more about this later in terms of how Israel solidified and normalized the status quo that emerged out of 1948, which continues until the present day. Okay. Oh, thank you so much, Jihad. So when we talk about the Nakba today, we focus a lot on May 15th as this um, symbolic day, uh, the day after Zionist militias declare the state of Israel's establishment. But in reality, fighting, um, as Jihad mentioned, and we'll uh, talk about more later, um, I believe, um, continues well into mid-October of 1948 when Egyptian forces retreated. Uh, it was then that remaining Palestinians from over 40 villages, or 53 villages, excuse me, um, all around the Gaza district, as well as other districts such as Yaffa, uh, the Ramla district, the Hebron district, are all forced from their homes and set up camp in what we know today as the Gaza Strip. In many villages, uh, like Isdud, where my family is from, 
wives and children went ahead of fathers and elders to Gaza, and weeks or months later, in some cases, the remaining Palestinians were trucked to and dropped off at the armistice line by retreating Egyptians uh, and or Zionist militias. In January of 1949, uh, in agreement with the UN, the American Friends Service Committee, also known as the Quakers, uh, take charge of relief operations in the area. The UN Relief and Works Agency, or UNRWA, would not start operating until 1951, officially. By 1953, most refugees, though, through their own connections or directly as a result of UNRWA efforts, moved from tents into more permanent shelters into the eight camps that exist today. Um, those that you see listed there in order of size, Jabalia, Rafah, Shati, Khan Yunus, Insarat, Brej, Maghazi, and Deir al-Balah. Um, all of these camps are officially established in 1950, except for Maghazi, which was uh, officially established uh, slightly before. The eight camps, um, which is something I think is important to, to mention uh, for outright, um, is that they occupy less than, officially less than seven square miles of the Strip's 140 square miles. However, they are the largest contributors to the high density of the Strip. And so that's something for us to keep in mind as we move forward. Um, something else I want to take a minute to focus on here uh, is that while we often talk about the rupture of the Nakba in the sense of the decimation of Palestinian rural life in the South and across the country, which it was, it's also a moment of immense transformation of Palestinian social relations in urban centers like Gaza and smaller cities like Khan Yunus and Rafah at the time were smaller cities. Um, and I think this is something that we can try to come back to at the end uh, talking about the displacement we're witnessing now, which will have major repercussions we may not have seen, uh, the likes of which we have not seen uh, certainly since 1948. And it's difficult, I think, at this moment to really tackle that. I'm not sure any of us feel equipped to do so, but realistically, the amount of loss that we are witnessing now is likely to result in entirely new camps in new locations uh, for quite some time. And so we're looking um, at not only a second, certainly there have been many ruptures, but a second rupture, the size of the Nekve um, in Gaza, but also a complete reorganization of uh, spatially of the Strip um, in the coming months. Inside the Strip, um, each of these eight camps that were created as a result of the Nekve in areas uh, also became identified as housing individuals from certain villages. Uh, that is not to say that refugees from Majda, Lisdud, or Bir Saba were always in one place, but large sections of family trees often stayed together initially, and those neighborhoods within camps were referred to colloquially accordingly, right? So it's very common to go through um, towns and, uh, and camps throughout the Gaza Strip, and people will tell you, oh, if, if you're looking for um, you know, Najjar is dude, they're over there. If you're looking for Najjar uh, Majdal, they're over there, right? So there was this very um, sort of uh, colloquial understanding of space as well. Jihad, do you want to um, talk to us a little bit about the 50s before we go into 56? Yes. So um, the immediate post Nakba history shows that uh, Palestinian refugees in Gaza resisted their displacement uh, through the normalization of the demarcation or armistice line. Um, for uh, these Palestinians, the land beyond the demarcation line was perceived um, as a lost paradise to which generations of refugees yearned to return. Um, and this is something that even a general like Moshe Dayan recognized in, uh, in, in one of his uh, eulogies uh, that I can talk about in the Q&A. Um, as for uh, the early refugees, um, it took them time to comprehend that the demarcation line had become uh, practically impassable. Um, and I'm talking here about the what people call today the borders between Gaza and Israel. And, uh, and then, but also there were attempts throughout the 1950s by Palestinian refugees to cross the demarcation line, to uh, go to their towns and villages, uh, to cultivate their lands, to uh, reclaim some of their property or belongings. 
Because remember, when people left their homes, uh, they left in a rush. They were uh, being chased out by Zionist militias and then what would become the Israeli military. Uh, so people, and again, uh, the, the, there, there wasn't a precedent in Palestine's history in which uh, the, the inhabitants if, who had to uh, evacuate or uh, move to a safer place as a result of a situation of war or conquest uh, weren't able to go back. So people who became stuck in Gaza as refugees um, tried to cross back to their villages. Now, these attempts uh, of return, uh, whether it was temporary or permanent, uh, whether to reclaim cattle or belongings or to harvest uh, fields or to uh, pick up fruit or vegetables um, were uh, brutally confronted by kibbutz residents uh, and military outposts located near the demarcation line the 1950 armistice line and uh, and this armistice line began to develop into a frontier of confrontation and resistance despite its artificial nature uh, later on the demarcation line would take a physical shape of a fence um, and but also it would become engraved in the, in the Palestinian collective memory and awareness uh, as both a material and symbolic monument of the rap of the territorial and em uh, emotional rupture that, that uh, was caused by the 1948 Nakba. And that's why in Gaza there aren't many monuments of the Nakba because for Palestinians in Gaza, the Gaza Strip in its current shape and composition and, 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 and form and the way it exists in terms of the proximity of the refugees to their former towns and villages, the Gaza Strip itself is a monument of the Nakba. So in the 50s, um, uh, what the, the 1950s decade, witnessed what Israeli historian Benny Morris calls the border wars uh, era, referring to clashes around ar that happened around the Gaza Strip Israel frontier and across the demarcation line. Um, and of course, there were similar instances in, uh, in the West Bank and along the, the Israeli, Arab, uh, Israeli borders with Arab states. Um, attempts by refugees to return to their towns and villages after 48 were labeled as uh, infiltrations by Israel and were received with, again, with brutal acts of retaliation. In, in 1954, Israel issued the Prevention of Infiltration Law, uh, in which the definition of infiltrators included a Palestinian citizen or a Palestinian resident without nationality or citizenship, or whose nationality or citizenship was doubtful and who during the said period left his ordinary place of residence in an area which has become part of Israel for a place outside Israel. One of the most violent examples of Israel's attempts to crush the what, what it called infiltration was the Khan Yunis massacre of 1956, when more than 270 Palestinians lost their lives, including 140 refugees, after uh, being murdered in cold blood by invading Israeli forces in 1956 following Gaza's occupation by Israel. And But that didn't stop Palestinians from attempting to return to their lands beyond the demarcation line. Um, and, and of course, you know, the, the, there is this whole discourse about Palestinians, uh, you know, uh, would forget about their their uh, their homes and villages and towns, but on the contrary, the inability of Palestinian refugees to return to their land uh, supplied them with the will and determination to return to their homes and to resist the normalizing of their condition of disposition within Gaza by preserving their memory and attachment to their land beyond the fence and by by uh, centering the right of return as the key demand throughout the generations. Yeah, thanks so much for that, Jihad. Um, so we are kind of coming off of that conversation on the 50s and into 56. We are coming up now in just two days or so on the anniversary of the first attempted full occupation of the Gaza Strip in November of 56, which lasted in varying degree until February of 57. Um, I w we wanted to kind of take a moment to mention this occupation for a few reasons. Um, one is, which we had just mentioned, which is sort of the, the, the massacre of Khanin, uh, in Khan Yunus and Rafah. But also, um, it is an early marker kind of of the strength, as, as Jihad alluded to, of the growing resistance in Gaza. 
Um, I think we would both recommend for more on this um, our Gaza and History episode, as well as John Pierre Fulou's book Gaza History. There's been the secondly, there's been a lot of talk in the last several weeks of the Israeli war, current Israeli war on Gaza, uh, turning regional. And I think it's important to highlight that not only is this not new for Palestine overall in the region, but Gaza specifically, even prior to the reference of the Strip and the West Bank as the quote unquote occupied Palestinian territories of 67, as we know them today, uh, this question has been you know, central to regional and, and European colonial efforts of domination for territory and resources for quite some time. Finally, and for our purposes here, most importantly, this is when a collective memory begins to really build in Gaza around massacres in refugee camps. The massacres of Rafah and Khan Yunus, though not thoroughly documented in English uh, beyond UN documents until about a decade ago uh, with uh, Joe Seco's graphic novel Footnotes in Gaza, these massacres of hundreds of young men um, have lived in the memory of Palestinian refugees in Gaza for decades. Uh, like children today who have grown up entirely under the Israeli blockade and siege uh, of the Strip, the children who survived the Nakba and those born in Gaza directly after 48 hold the massacres of those young men executed by firing squad in Khan Yunus and Rafah deeply in those communities, um, many of them as their first memories. All of this is to give a sense of how integral these moments are for the growth of the camps in the Strip which while covering a very small surface area, as mentioned earlier, are inescapable in understanding the character and experience of the population that fills the entirety of the area. In 67, of course, the entirety of the Strip was occupied by the Israeli military. And in the map to your right, you can see a map of Gaza after the construction of Israeli settlements, which are present until 2005. Um, Jihad will talk a little bit about this when we move into key places and sites. Um, in much of the same way that settlements in the West Bank take higher ground in Gaza, or take higher ground, excuse me, in the West Bank, in Gaza this translated into coastal areas, particularly in the south. Um, if you look there uh, on the southern coast. Oops! Oh my goodness! Sorry, guys. Here we go. So um, now, while as we mentioned earlier, the official space of the camps is not as large as one might anticipate given the numbers and percentage of the refugees at over 70% of the population, the camps have not been the sole space, of course, that uh, is occupied by Palestinian refugees in the Gaza Strip. Whether it's Gaza City, uh, the main towns of Deir al-Balah, Khan Yunus, Rafah, or others, refugee families and communities through their own work inside Gaza or through remittances from family in the Gulf or other parts of the world were able to um, elevate themselves economically and move out of the camps and own homes and property throughout the Strip. One of the things that has been so difficult to see in the last several weeks is the amount of homelessness that has been created. At no point in the history of the Gaza Strip since 1948 have so many people been displaced and put in a situation where there are no buildings left to go back to. Many of these individuals have been made refugees once again, two or three generations after their elders had finally managed to build a life outside of the camps, uh, as well as those that, are, that were certainly still living within them that have lost those homes as well. Um, Jihad's gonna talk a little bit uh, on some of these key sites that you see in your maps here. Thank you, Noor. Um, so, I'm going to talk about um, these key places and sites in Gaza, but I also I invite everybody who's tuning in and anybody who's going to watch the recording later on to, uh, on their own, to open Google Maps, uh, use the satellite uh, feature, and just, you know, zoom in and out and look at Gaza's uh, space uh, through the, the lens of uh, so through this bird's view, the satellite view from above, because it will uh, help you understand some of the things that I'm going to talk about. Um, do we have the slides on, on the full screen? Okay, thank you. Um, so the Gaza Strip, the current Gaza Strip, uh, is the largest contiguous geographic space in all of historic Palestine today. 
And I know this might be shocking for people because people think of the West Bank as, um, a, you know, as a as a large territory, which is true theoretically. But if you look at areas uh, areas A uh, within the West Bank, none of them match uh, the the areas that are under direct uh, Palestinian authority control, um, which is also relative. None of them match the Gaza Strip in terms of its uh, territory as a contiguous uh, Palestinian entity from within. So this is very important to keep in mind. And, and, and the Gaza Strip itself represents around 1% of the total area of historic Palestine. This is the area that includes what is today the state of Israel, the West Bank, and the Gaza Strip. The Gaza Strip uh, is divided into... Uh, from an administrative standpoint is divided into five main governorates in Arabic muhafadat, uh, jama' plural of muhafadha. The first one from the north is uh, the North, Ga north Gaza governorate, and then uh, to the south of it is the Gaza governorate, uh, middle area, Khan Yunus and Rafah. Each one of these governorates include um, uh, a number of uh, cities, towns, villages, refugee camps, um, and uh, and other communities. I'll start by talking a little bit about North Gaza, which is an important uh, uh, you know site given what's happening now. North Gaza is uh, the uh, north most northern part of the Gaza Strip, and uh, it it's home to two important towns, Beit Hanun and Beit Lahia. Uh, these are towns that uh, that have been around forever. They're inhabited by people who uh, engage mostly in agriculture. Um, they're famous for stro for for strawberry and orchards and and other agricultural products. But also the North Gaza governorate is important because um, the Erez checkpoint is there. Uh, it was one of the checkpoints that were. Uh, 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 taken over on October 7th. Uh, in Arabic, uh, Erez checkpoint is called the Beit Hanun crossing uh, after this, the town of Beit Hanun, which is the closest Palestinian town of it. Uh, the Erez checkpoint is a notorious checkpoint for many reasons. It's uh, Gaza's uh, one of Gaza's few access points into what is today the state of Israel, the West Bank, and uh, Jerusalem. Uh, it's where uh, you know, individuals travel and cross to either receive medical treatment in the West Bank and Jerusalem. Um, I myself traveled through the Erez crossing in 2013 to do my uh, visa interview at the U.S. consulate in Jerusalem. So students who have uh, scholarships in the United States, they travel to the Erez checkpoint in the north um, in order for them to uh, go to Jerusalem or go to other parts of uh, the West Bank or the Gaza Strip. Journalists, uh, health workers, um, foreign NGO workers uh, who are fortunate to receive permits from the Israeli military cross through the Erez checkpoint. Um, and I said the Erez checkpoint is a notorious checkpoint because um, it's really difficult to get a permit to travel through it. It takes weeks, sometimes months. Um, uh, cancer patients who, who need chemotherapy in Palestinian hospitals in the West Bank and Jerusalem or those who need uh, certain levels of care in Israeli hospitals uh, sometimes die while they wait for their permits. Uh, there were also cases of uh, Palestinian children who needed to receive medical treatment uh, to, in, in the West Bank and Jerusalem. Uh, they were able to, to travel, but Israel denies their parents' permits. So there were all of these heartbreaking stories of children, uh, you know, uh, dying uh, in, in the West Bank or in Jerusalem, and local volunteers, uh, you know, put their parents on FaceTime to say the, the final uh, words of goodbye to their kids. So Erez is a very, uh, is, a, is, is notorious. It's not a place that people in Gaza uh, like or like to think about. It's also used to recruit uh, collaborators uh, through blackmail, and I can't talk about this in the Q&A more. Um, 
So Beit Hanun and Beit Lahia in the north uh, also have been subject to uh, brutal Israeli incursions during the Second Intifada and during successive uh, aggressions on Gaza in 2014. And now uh, Beit Hanun and Beit Lahia are totally, completely decimated. And this is um, and, and these areas now are uh, an important site for the ground invasion um, and the ongoing battles between the Palestinian factions in Gaza and the invading Israeli military. South of North Gaza, we have the Gaza Governorate, which includes the city of Gaza, Gaza City itself, uh, which is the most important urban center in the Gaza Strip. It's the seat of government, uh, and it's home to vital institutions, universities, companies, the private sector, the Gaza port is there, and it's also home to Ashata refugee camp. Um, uh, which uh, which is one of the largest refugee camps in Gaza. And, and I forgot to mention that in North Gaza, of course, there is the city of Jabalia and the, the Ref Jabalia refugee camp, which uh, was bombed uh, uh, recently and, and, and Israel committed the, a massacre in which more than more than 400 Palestinians were killed. Um, and, and I think Shata refugee camp, which is located uh, to the west of Gaza city, Shata is Arabic for, for the beach, um, is also one of the most densely populated uh, refugee camps in Gaza, and uh, and 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 the and the, and the Shatta refugee camp and Gaza City are you know in, they're they're attached to each other. So uh, and people in in the rest of the Gaza Strip commute to Gaza City on a daily basis for work, for school, and for other purposes. South of the Gaza Governorate, there is the middle area, also known as Deir el Balah. Uh, governorate with um, with Deir el Balah city, where I come from, as uh, the central uh, city in in this uh, region. Um, Deir el Balah governorate is home to a number of refugee camps, including Al Nusayrat, Al Brej, Al Maghazi, Deir el Balah camp, and Deir el Balah is uh, is used to be an important agricultural town. Now it's uh, it's uh, it's an urban center of. 100,000 people or more still, there is agricultural activity. And Deir el-Balah is the part of the Gaza Strip where the, uh, the, Gaza, the, the, the Gaza Strip becomes, uh, at its, I don't know if this is the best way to describe it, as at its, its thinnest um, port, uh, point. So just to, give, to put things into perspective, my family's home is in the middle of Deir el-Balah. Uh, when I go to the roof, if I look to the west, I see the Mediterranean Sea. And if I look east, I see the, the armistice line, the border fence that separates Gaza from what is, this, what is today the state of Israel. So it, it is a small territory. You can feel the confinement and you can feel how small it is just on a daily basis. South to Deir al-Balah, there is Khan Yunus. Uh, Khan Yunus used to be an important, uh, it is an important town, was always important, especially throughout the Mamluk and Ottoman eras. Uh, it's named Khan Yunus because, because, because there was a Khan in it, which was a, a hostel uh, that uh, people traveling from Palestine to Egypt and vice versa would use to spend the night to, you know, uh, resupply water and food, uh, you know, park their caravans and get some rest. And it was also an important coastal uh, town throughout the Mamluk and Ottoman era. Khan Yunus is also home to Khan Yunus camp and it's surrounded by many towns and villages, uh, mostly agricultural, uh, especially close to the, the border with Israel. Um, towns like Khuza'a and, and Abbasan were subject to brutal destruction and violence throughout uh, throughout Israel's successive aggressions on Gaza. And then there is Rafah, towards the south. Rafah borders both Egypt and Israel. And uh, the Rafah governorate is home, of course, to the city of Rafah, which uh, is an important Palestinian city. It's a border town. Rafah was divided as a result of the Camp David Accords into an Egyptian Rafah and a Palestinian Rafah. So the border between Palestine and Egypt uh, separates uh, the city of Rafah, the historic city of Rafah, into two. And, um, and uh, you know, people from... The city of Rafah became both Palestinian and Egyptian citizens, their cousins, their, their relatives, um, and they're connected by uh, blood and, and other uh, ways. Um, Rafah is also where the uh, Rafah crossing is located. It's Gaza's only gate to the world 
where you don't have to pass through an Israeli uh, checkpoint or through Israeli examination. Unfortunately, the Rafah crossing hasn't been consistently open since the beginning of the blockade on Gaza in 2007. So this, in summary, you know, uh, an, uh, is an overview of uh, of Gaza. Now, while talking about Gaza's current uh, reality, it's important also to highlight the role the settlements played in shaping Gaza's current geographic and demographic realities. And I say this recognizing that one of the major talking points of Israel and, and its supporters was that Israel withdrew from Gaza in 2005 um and uh and you know israel left gaza so why is everybody angry and we can discuss this in the q a but um it is important to recognize what kind of impact israeli settlements created in gaza throughout the decades and ask ourselves why why was israel there to begin with and why was there an, an, a settlement project in in this big refugee camp um so the current reality in Gaza cannot be understood without the, the, the impact of the settlements. As you all can see on the map, those settlements were uh, took over almost one third of the area of the Gaza Strip. And uh, they caused uh, geographic fragmentation. The, uh, and the settlers took over the Gaza Strip's most fertile lands and, uh, and abused Gaza's freshwater uh, aquifer causing um, a long-term impact that, that is still felt by Palestinians there, even after the Israeli state withdrew its settlers and redeployed them uh, to the West Bank and other parts of historic Palestine in 2005. So um, great environmental and, and impact on, on the Gaza Strip, even after the, the, the withdrawal. And uh, throughout the decades of settler presence in Gaza, those settlements uh, fragmented the Gaza Strip into three uh, uh, three uh, fragments. So as you can see, um, you know, we have the settlement of Netzarim separating um, the Gaza governorate from the middle governorate and throughout the second intifada, uh, this entire area which is also today, you know, which is adjacent to the Wadi Gaza, the Gaza Valley uh, line, which Israel today is, is referring to as the evacuation line separating uh, northern Gaza from southern Gaza. So Israel built checkpoints on, 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 on the main two roads connecting the Gaza Strip north to south. Uh, the Al Bahar Road, the the Sea Road, which is close to the shoreline, and Salah al Din Road, which is um, in 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 the center of the Gaza Strip. So throughout the Second Intifada, Israel cut both of these roads, established checkpoints there, and separated uh, Gaza City from the rest of the Gaza Strip. Uh, so if you were uh, a university student who, who needed to attend. Uh, college uh, every day, you had to travel from Deir al Balah or Khan Yunis by car, stop on one side of the of the checkpoint on the sea road or on Salah al Din road, and then walk on the beach for 20 to 30, maybe sometimes 40 minutes um, throughout the year uh, under different you know weather conditions, and then hop in a different cab on the other side of Natsarim and then make it to your school and college. Um, the same thing happened uh, around, uh, you know, the Gosh Katif block, which separated the middle area from Khan Yunis and Rafah. Uh, there was a notorious checkpoint called Mahfouza, which uh, uh, also known as Abu Holi al Matahin, uh, which separated the middle area and, and Gaza City from Khan Yunis and Rafah. This checkpoint used to close not only for hours, but sometimes for days, weeks, uh, 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 non stop. So, again, the settlements caused this, this uh, immense fragmentation, this immense environmental impact, this immense um, uh, destruction for life in, in, in Gaza. And I think it is important to recognize uh, these, uh, this history as we talk about Gaza today. Thank you so much, Jihad. I'm sorry for all the premature clicking. My computer has a mind of its own. Um, okay, so moving uh, slightly and uh, to to the present, to the last several weeks, um, since October seventh, uh, this question of uh, obviously history, as we have hopefully um, made clear, right? Does, and we have said time and again, does not start in October seventh, but 
since uh, that day and since in the last several weeks, uh, we do want to also bring in some of the geography we've been discussing into the current moment. Um, the current information uh, or the information I should say that you see here changes by the minute, but was largely accurate as of a day ago. Uh, we've heard a lot in the news and through social media about the level of devastation, but what this means in, in real tangible terms is important. The tonnage of bombs dropped in Gaza has now superseded that of the nuclear bomb in Hiroshima. The Israelis have essentially nuked the Gaza Strip, but in stages and spread from north to south. Euromed Monitor announced uh, just this morning uh, that tonnage will, the total tonnage of uh, uh, released on, on Gaza will reach the equivalent of two nuclear bombs by the end of the week if bombing continues at the current rate. As of this morning as well, the Indonesian hospital, which you see uh, on, marked on the map to the left as running on a backup generator, has run out of fuel and is no longer running on a backup generator. This means no electricity and the end of surgeries. Wounded Palestinians will have one less place to receive treatment in what is already a catastrophic health sector situation, which every major global medical uh, and public health organization has termed a complete collapse of adequate health services. These numbers uh, that we see here, the hundreds of schools, uh, the hospitals, the buildings, the tonnage of bombardment, um, patients in need, do not even touch on the dead and wounded. Over 9,000 Palestinians have been killed and accounted for, with an additional 2,000 more still under the rubble. Injuries are over 20,000. 32 journalists have been killed, with many more threatened. There is no individual left in Gaza or who has family in Gaza who has not lost someone they love. There is not one neighborhood that has been untouched by the bombings. And even despite all of this, Palestinians in Gaza are looking out for one another in unprecedented ways since the evacuation. So this evacuation that we keep talking about, oh, where did it go? There it is. Uh, the evacuation order to everyone north of Wadi Ghazza, which you can see in the map on the right, came to residents in trickles. Um, I think many of us uh, woke up to news or others of us that were following by the minute. We imagine kind of one big announcement, but in reality, what played out um, was hours and hours of confusion. Uh, as a result of so many Palestinians in Gaza working with NGOs, the, the massive international aid sector and the UN, employees began to let their families know uh, earlier in the day that orders were coming in for a mass evacuation of Gaza City and northern areas. Rumors swirled very quickly that this was a trick or a hoax, and it was not out of the realm of the possibility that that was the case, given that fake evacuation calls are often made to apartment buildings and had already occurred to many people in the area in the days prior. Soon, however, everyone received the text that you see uh, here in English. Uh, my cousin sent me a copy of it below. You'll see her comment, God save us. Um, and shortly thereafter, a, a mass exodus from the North began. Despite every international agency, NGO, and hospital insisting that such a mass evacuation was impossible, without immense planning and safety procedures, Israel declared that any civilian remaining in these areas would be considered an enemy combatant. One thing that is really important to keep in mind here is not just the 1.1 million people that this area covers, or even the many hospitals and emergency personnel within it that could not and would not evacuate or abandon their patients. It is, this, it is that this also covers the entirety of Gaza City. So that governorate, governorate that um, Jihad was mentioning, um, north of North Gaza, and also the city of Gaza, right? Um, after what had our, what has already been mass destruction of neighborhoods like Ramal in Gaza City or Tal al Hawa, Israel was declaring and has now operationalized an intent to wipe out the largest Palestinian urban center off the map. Over 1 million Palestinians who have either evacuated or been displaced from the destruction of their homes 
are sheltering in UN buildings, hospital compounds, schools, and more than anything else in each other's homes. In the Southern Strip, there is no home in Rafah, Deir al-Balah, in Sarat, Khan Yunus that is not filled to the brim. Homes with one or two apartments that previously housed six or seven or at most 10 individuals are now housing 60 as entire family trees have consolidated. Those refugees we mentioned earlier who moved to Gaza City after a life of economic transition are now back in camps with grandparents, neighbors, and more often complete strangers. Um, the slide that I did not intend to skip over but was uh, slightly misplaced here shows um, the destruction uh, and massacres that have happened just over the last two days, three days, um, camps. Uh, Jihad mentioned the Jabalia camp massacre, just to give you an, an idea of encouraging you to go on Google Maps, go on Palestine Open Maps, um, use the sort of zoom out satellite function, um, as well as the ability to move from historical to sort of present day mapping. But here we wanted to give you sort of an idea of just how much space those six one-ton bombs that hit the Jabalia camp and killed those 400 people um, cover. We look at the amount of homes there. Um, yesterday, uh, another camp was hit in Serat. And this morning, we woke up to the news of the Brej camp um, being hit, which you can see there in the center. So these... The, the the sort of impact of destruction, right, not only beyond, certainly beyond the north, but also beyond the city and, and very much at the center of camps where people are take, currently taking shelter and have taken shelter for decades, uh, I think is important for all of us to keep in mind. Um, Jihad, you want to talk about some of these images? Yes, of course. And, and I think you know, I think an important uh, lesson that can be uh, taken from how Israel has been uh, bombarding Gaza and, and destroying it is that the, the, is the realization that there isn't a military solution. Um, uh, th there isn't any proof that the Israelis have a clear strategy in order to uh, uh, achieve the, the, the declared goals of their operation. So what do they do instead? They flatten the Gaza Strip, they flatten Gaza City, they destroy um, the economic heart of the city as we see in this picture. This is a Rimal uh, neighborhood, it's Gaza's uh, beating heart uh, when it comes to uh, econ you know, the economy, trade, businesses, the private sector. Um, so this is, you know, simply uh, a form of collective punishment that reflects that the Israelis don't have a strategy, they don't have a plan, and they don't have a path forward besides uh, mass destruction and mass killing. Um, it's going to be very difficult to rebuild. Uh, where the scale of destruction is unprecedented. And uh, all this talk about, uh, you know, by world leaders, politicians, uh, about, uh, you know, Israel targeting a specific group and sparing the civilians doesn't work. And it, it proved to be uh, baseless. We're witnessing uh, a mass destruction of Gaza and, and, ma and the mass killing of civilians there. Um, and this brings us to an important question. What are the scenarios ahead of us? What, what is going to happen? And I think, and as I said, the, we're dealing with three possible scenarios. One, uh, a military, uh, a military solution uh, on the ground, which I don't think is tenable. There isn't a military solution. It's the the more weeks have passed, and Israel has hasn't made any progress in terms of its ground operation. Uh, it's being met by fierce resistance on the ground, and. Uh, and the more time passes, Israel increases the civilian toll, which uh, threatens to engulf uh, the region in, in more uh, 
uh, in, in more bloodshed and violence, which I don't think will be good for anyone. The second scenario is uh, something that has been talked about in Israeli official circles, as we see this document that has been leaked uh, from the Israeli government uh, talking about contemplating uh, the option of expelling Palestinians to the Sinai um, or to other parts of Egypt. And I fail to see that, of course, Palestinians in Gaza will will not accept this scenario. They, this isn't new. In the mid-1950s, the United Nations contemplated a plan to resettle uh, thousands of Palestinian refugees in Gaza who were living under really awful conditions then. Remember, those people were living in tents. Uh, they were suffering from disease, brutal winters, and so on and so forth. But once Palestinians in Gaza in the 50s heard about plans to resettle them in the Sinai and to uh, uh, to end their political demands for return and liberation, the, the, uh, there was an, a mass uprising in Gaza against uh, those uh, plans and the Palestinians there demanded their Egyptian rulers not to even entertain um, the thought of uh, resettling Palestinians in the Sinai. But also in terms of, I mean, if we look at, the, at this issue from, uh, you know, like a long-term perspective point of view, uh, I fail to see how expelling Palestinians to the Sinai will uh, bring the Israelis any security. I mean, the Sinai Peninsula is twice the size of historic Palestine and uh, it has shores that are impossible to monitor and access to uh, smuggling routes around the world, war-torn countries, and so on and so forth. So how is Israel going to, uh, how is the expulsion of Palestinians to the Sinai going to uh, resolve the situation on the ground now? I fail to see that. And the third scenario is a return to the status quo. And of course, you know, I'm happy to talk about this in the Q&A. The status quo is what led us to this point, so there has to be a different path forward. Um, so I think, I think you know, it's going to be very difficult to uh, imagine uh, Israel achieving any of its goals as, as part of this campaign, besides, of course, you know, destroying Gaza and killing civilians, which they have been doing uh, and unfortunately hasn't been uh, stopped yet. Um, and the trajectory of the ground invasion so far, uh, the Isra Israeli forces are trying to enter from uh, two uh, areas, from the north and from the uh, Gaza, north of the Gaza Valley area, simply because the Gaza Valley area, which uh, was also uh, where the settlement of Netzarim was located, uh, it's also home to Al Zahra city, which is a recent community uh, that was built. Uh, and established throughout the past 20 years or so. Um, I think the trajectory of the ground invasion will basically focus on uh, cutting off Gaza City as we see uh, from north of the evacuation, the so-called evacuation line, and attempts to enter uh, through the north and take over Beit Hanun and Beit Lahia and advance towards Gaza City. This is going to be very bloody, and uh, and Israeli forces are going to suffer immense uh, losses in on, on the in the battle on the battlefield. Um, and again, I fail to see how the Israelis are going to uh, control Gaza City. Uh, this is going to be a very bloody fight. Um, and of course, uh, there are no, uh, there are, th there is, aren't any any ideas uh, put forward about what will happen if this ground invasion succeeds, which I heavily doubt. Thank you, Jihad. Um, I think you know we have so much more that we could we could say, but for the sake of time, we're gonna pause here um, and hand it back over to our beloved uh, Bassam uh, moderating, who I think has some questions from from audience and other folks. Thank you both very much, uh, Noor and Jihad. Sorry, I was uh, exiting the PowerPoint. This was really remarkable, and uh, I was trying to take notes and um, very excited that we are doing this. And I know that uh, from the comments that we've been getting that this is something that will be shared widely, not least in, uh, in classrooms. I uh, thank you for uh, preparing this because unfortunately uh, for me, I, um, well, unfortunately for others, 
there are so many other questions that we had that are actually answered in, in what you provided. But I do have a couple of questions, and I think we will try to ask uh, some questions from the audience, although I don't want to keep you here for too long. But the question I'd like to ask you both, Noor and uh, Jihad, um, is that as you have now examined Gaza's past and present from a geographical perspective, how can we also discuss Gaza's future through the same length of geography? If you can shed some light on that before we move on to other questions. Noor, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, I think for me, one thing to kind of keep in mind is is this much longer, I mean, not to be too sentimental about it, but this much longer arch of history that Gaza is, is part of and, uh, and of its story. I mean, Jihad and I started for, for the sake of for time, obviously, um, in sort of this mandate Palestine mode. But Gaza, Kamadina, as a, as a city and as a, as a general area, the southern coast of Palestine, I mean, you are talking about centuries of um, of sort of invasion and resistance, and movement and displacement um, in in the more negative realm of it. For moving forward, I think we have to also move out of the rhetoric and language of inevitability. I think we tend, uh, for for very human reasons, right, in moments like this to imagine um, only one way forward or to have a very difficult time imagining any way forward, um, sort of as Jihad alluded to in sort of looking at what Israel is doing and not quite seeing an end game that works for anybody, including them uh, in, with something like the regards to the Sinai. But I think something that I, I would like to point out is also the imagination of Palestinians is much wider than Gaza and much wider than also its historic district. Um, there is constantly um, an active move forward, right? That Samud is not just surviving something, um, but it's, it is planning for the future. And when you talk to people in Gaza, even in the middle of, of the sheer destruction and horror that they are living through in the last several weeks, um, I have cousins still filling out college applications, you know, a cousin who was accepted to the Fulbright program um, in the US and who is with a lack of electricity working, um, you know, on in her notes app on her phone, uh, trying to type up her personal essays. So the look forward um, in Gaza is very present in the lives of individuals. And I think it is our job um, outside of Gaza to not lose sight of that and to not be so uh, drowning in despair that we we do not uh, also look forward uh, as opposed to just in the current humanitarian crisis. Jad? Yes, I think what's, I mean, we've been talking about this for years and I think, uh, and by this I mean Gaza's past, present and future and I have written about it a lot and uh, did plenty of uh, public engagement on this issue and and I think, you know, one of the one of the ways that can help us understand Gaza is to think about it as a place that has become a limbo between different possibilities that uh, that are impossible to uh, to realize. So Gaza becomes a limbo, a suspended place between um, between home and uh, between being going home and, and, and a state of refugeehood becomes uh, a limbo between statelessness and the the plight for liberation and independence. becomes a place where people's lives. Um, and dreams and aspirations and experiences are suspended uh, due to the equation that resulted from the 1948 Nakba. And, and again, the Nakba is key here because this geographic reality that we describe, this demographic reality that we describe, this experiment that is the Gaza Strip that we talked about, Nothing about it is normal, and nothing about it should be accepted. And it was, and, and the Gaza Strip in its current shape and form was meant to be a temporary refuge and not a place where people are supposed to dwell for eternity under these conditions. So, 
Um, but what happened after 1948 is that Israel, backed by the international community, sought to normalize uh, this reality in Gaza and make it eternal. And in addition to that, uh, add insult to the wounds of history by also building settlements there in the most cynical attempts to tell Palestinians that they don't matter. And even if they ended up in, 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 in the most densely populated refugee camp, Israel is going to come after them and plant a settlement next to their, next to their crowded camps. So what does that say about how the international community has approached the Palestine question? There is a total disregard for Palestinian humanity. There is a total disregard for Palestinian human needs, for Palestinian aspirations, for Palestinian um, uh, for the, for Palestinians' um, need for dignity. Um, and I think this is very important to think about. I mean, one of the issues I tried to raise over the past few years, and I will stop shortly, but I need to highlight this: is the is the fact that in 30 years from now, there were projections that Gaza's population will double. So, the, so, and if you think about the current rate of population density, we're talking about 6,000 people in a square kilometer in Gaza now. And by, uh, and by 2050, the population will double to uh, 4.5 million, increasing the, the population density to 12,000 per one square kilometer, recognizing that also Gaza doesn't have uh, any like resources to offer people so that they can have a dignified life. So in the discourse about the two-state solution, for example, we don't find anyone saying, what will happen to the Palestinians in Gaza? Where are they going to go? Are they going to be able to relocate to the West Bank as part of the two-state solution? Is there going to, is there, is there ever, has there ever been a conversation about natural population growth, which is the argument that Israel uses to justify settler settlement expansion in the West Bank. So I think, you know, when, when it comes to the future, Palestinians in Gaza have been aware for decades that this situation has never been sustainable and was never meant to be sustainable. So um, people are acting surprised now in, in, in the academic circles and beyond. And I think, and I think, you know, this is a moment of truth about um, how we, all of us let this experiment to become normalized and accepted and just totally act like everything is normal and pretend that nothing will happen and i think this is an important lesson that we need to take from from this uh, from, from this uh, from these events and in order to be able to reflect about the future not in not in abstract terms but also in ways that address actual critical practical needs of people and their dignity. And I'd add, I'd add too. I mean, in in sort of theme with the, with the with the teaching series and with what so much of us have been talking about, right? Uh, not only in regards to oh, history didn't start on October seventh, but spatially speaking, um, us talking about. I mean, it's fine to to have a conversation and inform people about sort of the historical geography of Gaza, etc. But us talking about Gaza as if it is an island, right? It falls also into the Israeli trap of, of wanting to isolate it, of wanting to discuss it as if it is separate from the larger question of Palestine, uh, as if it is not connected to the population in the West Bank or Palestinian citizens of Israel, for that matter, who are watching this also in horror um, with loved ones and community in, in Gaza. Um, and so, I mean, I think also the bigger the bigger question here for all of us as academics as teachers but also as just individuals and humans in the world watching a genocide unfold on live television right is to stop talking about Gaza as if it is separate from the larger war on Palestine um, and I and that's incredibly difficult, even for, for people like Jihad and I, especially maybe for people like Jihad and I, because we have family in Gaza and are totally absorbed in sort of the severity of the moment. But what is happening in the West Bank in regards to uh, prisoners and torture, the demolishing of uh, parts of the Janine refugee camp, for example, is not separate from the same um, right, MO uh, of the Israeli military occupation that we see in Gaza, but manifests quite differently um, and unfortunately has to also contend with the question of the Palestinian Authority. 
um, which uh, Gaza does, does not, though has other concerns as we've covered today. Thanks to both of you. Uh, very quickly, uh, I want to ask your question and then try to see if there's uh, I'm getting questions uh, directly on YouTube and elsewhere, but I am aware of the time. We don't want to go beyond 90 minutes. Uh, Noor, you have done work on um, imagining spaces of return. How does Gaza fit into that work? Yeah, I mean, only a, what, a couple of a month ago, I guess, uh, I and others, many others, um, both from the US and from Palestine were at Palestine, the rights festival in, in Philadelphia. And I sat with um, Salman Abu Sitta, who is a uh, great founder of the Palestine Land Society and, and author of Alice of Palestine. Um, and we were talking about uh, the, I think, sixth now annual uh, reconstruction competition that Palestine Land Society puts on the highest um, number of uh, submissions and participants that have signed up. And uh, what this competition is for those uh, watching who, who don't know is basically a young Palestinian architecture students submit designs for the reconstruction uh, of depopulated and destroyed Palestinian villages. Um, many of these submissions come from students in Gaza and for uh, any students um, around the world, regardless of whether they're located in Gaza or not, many of those villages that are being redesigned um, are from the larger Gaza um, district and the Gaza and Bir Seba subdistrict that um, Jihad mentioned early in the talk. And I think that, that this is important um, because, as I mentioned earlier, the questions of imagining futures and not only imagining return as sort of a theoretical possibility, but as a material reality have never um, dissipated from um, Palestinian social life, from conversation and from political aspiration. Um, even in the uh, sort of height of the two state moment, the centrality of the refugee question um, has always been maintained. And the belief uh, in the heart of hearts that these villages can be rebuilt um, and that there is space for them to be rebuilt, which is something that the competition really uh, focuses on. And I think that we should include in more of our conversations, um, right? A majority of the uh, over 400 villages that were um, depopulated were not built over. They are actually maintained. Uh, they, are, they are still empty land. Uh, I personally went to is do the village where my uh, family is from and you know there's nothing there i mean what is often referred to as ashdod as we watch hamas rockets land uh, on the port of ashdod yes it, it's part of the larger land space that was considered this dude but it's not actually where the houses were it's not where the village was it was not the heart of people's lives um and that's true for for hundreds of villages um, across historic palestine and so I think really reintegrating this question of um, spatial capacity um, for uh, imaginations and for liberated futures um, also has to be a big part of our conversations moving forward. Jihad, uh, I understand that uh, uh, you have family um, on the ground uh, in Gaza, and you don't have to answer this question, but is there anything that you can tell us about uh, the most recent current situation, uh, whether or not it relates to geography? So, sorry, could you repeat the question again? Um, I understand that you have family in Gaza, and you don't have to answer this question if you feel you'd like to skip, but can you just share with us from your uh, connections if you have any recent uh, you know, news as to what's been happening most recently, uh, whether or not it deals with geography? Yes, of course. I mean, uh, my family lives in Deir al-Balah, as I mentioned uh, during the presentation. So they, you know, they're fortunate to live uh, south of the so-called evacuation line, although, um, you know, we haven't been that fortunate. My grandmother was injured uh, by shrapnel and glass uh, as a result of a bombing. She's 88-year-old, uh, ill and frail and, and, uh, and 
can't walk. Um, so, my, you know, my cousin had to carry her down the stairs. She can't live in her home anymore. There are no windows or doors. So, you know, the people are dealing with these things. But I think, you know, I'm in touch with my younger brother who, um, who goes, you know, who leaves the house every day to buy groceries and try to, you know, uh, check in on his friends and neighbors and, and relatives. And um, we're, the, we're beginning to witness the, the, the social repercussions of, of, this, uh, of this situation. Uh, we're talking about, um, you know, like uh, uh, really concerning um, uh, repercussions in, 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 uh, in schools where people are sheltering. None of this is sustainable. None of this is humane. None of this, uh, you know, uh, like preserves people's dignity or, uh, or allows, you know, people to uh, be able to function normally as human beings. Um, so it is a difficult situation and, you know, the, 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 the level of uncertainty that people are living, I mean, we talk here about geopolitical uncertainty and political uncertainty, and, but there's also like a level of, you know, personal uncertainty that sometimes becomes, uh, uh pretty painful to deal with. Um, you ask, you call your, your, your family, your loved ones, and you ask them, how are you? The answer to this question has completely changed and it's now I'm alive. Uh, so how are you? I'm alive. Kif halak, aish. Next, <laughs> um, who's, who died today? And then, you know, they start listing, um, you know, friend, this neighbor, that, um, so, you know, also the, the feeling that, you know, this might be the last phone call. This might be the last conversation. This might be the last moment you you connect with your loved ones. And and, and for me, you know, being here, um, it's it's really difficult because I'm also like, you know, I'm, I'm involved in all of this advocacy work and all of this public education work and, you know, pushing people uh, to, to action. Uh, so, you know, this gives me a little time to to reach out to, you know, to my to my family and, and connect with them and, you know, be able to establish this connection just in case something happens. So it, this is even a luxury that many of us in the West can't afford. And that's why we need we need we need people to support us. We need people to help us. We, we need people to take leadership um, and we need people to, you know, step outside of their their comfort zone, think outside of the box and, 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 you know, just put a lot of energy into this, this, uh, this push for a ceasefire and for, um, and for putting an end to the, to the killing. Um, so I think it, it is difficult. Um, I don't know if I answered your question, <laughs> but you know, I, I think, I think even reflecting on the moment is something that we are not uh, able of doing. And I think, you know, my answer was probably like a, a brief attempt at that, but uh, thank you for the question, Bassam. Really appreciate it. No, thank you, Jihad, and I'm very sorry um, about uh, all that is happening to your family and to everyone else. Uh, I understand that the death toll now is um, uh, higher than 9,000, um, and uh, it is likely to, to expand uh, further if the ground incursion proceeds uh, Noor and uh, Jihad I hesitate to burden you with other questions I can send you the questions that some of the questions that we have um, uh, if you like separately just so you know what people wanted to to learn more about but we, we really cannot and should not keep you more than 90 minutes and, and we're, we're just hitting that right now um, are there any last words you'd like to share and as you think about that let me just say uh, share with everyone that uh, all the teachings that we have, uh, the four teachings that we conducted, and there will be more uh, once every week at least in the coming um, weeks, whether or not the uh, hostilities and the killing uh, continues, we will be continuing this project in order to provide and shed light on uh, not just Gaza, but uh, on uh, the Palestine question in general, which is why the uh, project Gaza and Context is housed in the a uh, broader uh, project titled Palestine and Context. And you can find all of the material on www. I don't know if anybody says W three times anymore. Palestineandcontext.org. And uh, you'll also find the um, Every Other Day podcast. We are 
uh, producing titled War on Palestine, which actually chronicles what's going on from uh, different perspectives and dimensions and addresses various dimensions of what is going on on the ground and beyond Gaza. So uh, you can also find those there, although you can uh, find uh, the podcast on SoundCloud and soon on Spotify. So I'll I'll stop here, uh, and I will thank also all our colla- our all our uh, uh, collaborators. I guess uh, it just sounds like a bad word, uh, and and the, the Palestine. See, is, is, Israel you know ru- Israel can ruin any word. Uh, basically, uh, all the people and institutions that uh, have joined in this. Uh, uh, projects. There's almost uh, two dozen of them, and the list is growing because a lot of organizations are contacting us themselves, wanting to partake in what is going on uh, here at Gaza and Context uh, teaching sessions. And uh, with that, I will thank you both very much, and we'll leave the last word uh, to you. Do you want to go first, Joe? <laughs> It's like I'm all talked up. Um, it's hard. I think right now it's it's a, a heavy heart every morning. As Jihad said, uh, we are waking up and having conversations with family. Um, the first two weeks uh, before the blackouts began, uh, communication blackouts began, it seemed as if everyone uh, I knew in Gaza would magically get uh, Wi-Fi around 3 a.m. So that's when I was up. Um, and... Yeah, it's uh, it's difficult increasingly day by day to know what to say to anyone. I feel like conversations were longer in the first couple of weeks, and now the conversations are, there's no bread. Um, there, we're out of gas to cook. Um, all we have is cans of things that can't be cooked without heat. Um, they are out of water. They are traveling five, six hours to charge a cell phone. Um, So I I feel like it's uh, it's very overwhelming and and difficult, as Jihad sort of uh, explained, that to reflect on a current moment. Um, But on a wider moment, I think um, the bigger issue uh, for all of us is to not accept that this war and like the four or five previous where nothing changes, where the siege recontinues, uh, that does not mean that we do not call for an immediate ceasefire, has to be the number one priority. But what comes after that ceasefire has to be pushed um, into conversation and not let go regardless of whatever version of victory Um, Israel wants to claim as it has in the past. Um, And I think that that's a call on all of us uh, outside of Gaza um, as much as it is, if not more, than anyone else. I agree with Noor. um, And I also think that um, one of the key takeaways from what we've witnessed over the past few weeks is the need for, and I and I don't say this uh, this line, you know, might sound like a cliche, but it actually isn't. There is a need for a new vision, for life in this part of the world, and and I and there is and people there. We need to end the assault on people's dignity. And I think this is very important. Israel is an abusive state in the West Bank, in Gaza, in 48, in the Julan. Uh, and this abuse, this violence, this lack of accountability, all have led us here. And, and I think there has to be a conversation about the, the networks, the institutions, the conglomerates that enabled decades of cynicism and normalized the acceptance of this reality on the ground. Um, There are 
layers and layers of, of interests and people who benefit, who have benefited from this reality, and who not only continue to maintain it, but also suppress any voices that say, this is wrong and cannot continue. And even voices that warned that an explosion in Gaza or in the West Bank were inevitable, and it was a matter of when, not if. So today we, you know, as we call for a ceasefire, which is the most pressing demand, and, and we call for an end to the blockade and for the restoration of dignity, um, and, and, I and I highlight the restoration of dignity as, as a demand here because um, we can't go back to, a, to, a, to the reality where kids from Gaza leave to die from cancer in the West Bank without their parents being by the, by their, the side of their bed. We can't continue to allow Israel to continue to abuse Palestinians, and destroy their lives. This has to stop. And I think it will take it will take a new process and a new configuration. And all of us will be part of it. But now is the time to call for a ceasefire. So ceasefire now. Thank you both. Thanks, Jihad and Noor. Uh, we are all, um, you know, uh, speechless. We are honored to have you on our uh, fourth iteration of these teachings and hopefully you will join us and uh, be part of our future teachings in various ways and uh, all power to you and thank you very much once again thank Bye you everyone Basim. thank you so much Salam.